everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bind. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Afterwards, stay on to unwind and take a mental break with yoga instructor Emma Poole. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Corn Ferry, Julie Serkin. Hi, thank you. I'm your moderator today, Julie Serkin. I'm with Corn Ferry, and I am in our national healthcare advisory practice. I've got a strong focus and passion in delivering total rewards strategies. And I also have a background in not only consulting, but I've spent a number of years working in large health systems in the total rewards practices. So I've been in your shoes, or a number of your shoes, and I look forward to an interesting and really a dynamic conversation that we can have today. So I wanna welcome you and I wanna thank you for joining us uh, for today's discussion on truly designing an inclusive health benefit. And we, we want you to walk away with a few things, a few key insights, uh, hopefully some candid insights from employers and um, on their needs from a benefit design to bring a more equitable coverage and reduce health disparities. And we'll get into a little bit more about what those are. Actionable information on key design principles of a truly inclusive health benefit and strategies even to implement. And we also hope for you to walk away with a deeper understanding of how and, and also why a more inclusive health benefit can be really a key differentiator in the, um, the ever continuing competition for talent that ever increases. So I wanna introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got a wonderful array of panelists on today and I'm gonna turn it over first to uh, Sarah Chavaria. Hi everyone, thank you, Julie, thank you so much. Um, Sarah Chavaria, I have spent a long, almost 30 year career in human resources and uh, we call it the people organization now, really focused on developing uh, organizations and effectiveness. And of course, in this role uh, that gets us to making sure that we're engaging our workforce and really understanding what their evolving needs are and specifically for today's conversation as it relates to their health and wellness and how we've had to, to think through that. I've also played in the healthcare space for about 20 of those years. Uh, personally have a really strong philosophy that healthcare is a right and uh, decided to spend my career in here working with very like-minded leaders and the workforce all engaged in a purpose around uh, bringing uh, better healthcare solutions uh, to the broader communities that we serve. So really, really happy to be here. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Ivor Horn. I am a pediatrician by training with spending several decades in academia doing research on health equity and health disparities before joining a company called Accolade as chief medical officer most recently. And Accolade is a health advocacy and health navigation um, company that helps employees navigate their health and benefits. And most recently joined Google as the director of health equity and product inclusion with Google Health and across Alphabet. And I'm really glad to be here. Um, I pass it over to Tony. Thanks, Iver. Hi everyone, I'm Tony Miller. I lead the team here at Bind. Um, this is my second health insurance startup. And um, so I've been spent my entire career in health insurance and have looked at like how insurance is currently designed and in fact, how some of that design actually creates barriers for health equity. And one of the things that we've been working on is building personalized health benefit plans that fit one of one. And that's been an interesting journey for us to look at how that then helps people get uh, a better health benefit and that it is more equitable for the individual. So looking forward to the conversation and um, thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, so as mentioned, uh, we have a great group of panelists and we look forward to some of your questions. We'll have a Q&A session as well during this. Um, but before we kind of really kick it off into some questions, I wanted to dive a little bit into what health equity and what we mean by that today. Uh, when so much of a person's health is tied to behaviors that are impacted by those, in, 
environmental, the economical, the social conditions, the where we live, work, and play, those what we call social determinants of health, right? And if we think about a health disparity, it's those avoidable, unfair differences in health status between segments of the population. Then on the flip side, in, in turn, health equity would be the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. So I wanted to start us off with thinking a little bit creatively about what products um, can be designed around health equity to help improve the quality of life. And more important also is even what, what industry players as well as those tools have the greatest power to have some significant change impact. Well, I'll, I'll jump in if you want, starting from, you know, from a, <laughs> both employer perspective. So, you know, I'm here uh, working for Delta Dental, so on the payer side and specifically focused on um, oral health. And, you know, we provide care for over 38 million members across 15 states. So when I think about um, this, I think about it really balanced. We have, you know, both, I have a responsibility to make sure that we're, really looking at what the needs are of our workforce and meeting those needs through some innovative things that we weren't thinking about 20 years ago, right? From a, from a health and wellness perspective. And we also employ individuals who live across a variety of communities. And so, you know, what they have available to them and have access to is, is equally important. So for example, you know, in, in coming to Delta Dental about three and a half years ago and really supporting the organization through a transformation that included a cultural transformation where we're really getting in touch with those employees. Some of those, you know, you call them products or, you know, some of the things that we were looking at that we might not have been looking at before probably fell more into the wellness category, right? So how can we support our employee population in getting out and getting active? How can we support them with some benefit designs that enable them to be really proactive about their care, right? Kind of getting that, that um, preview of how healthy they are once a year and really incenting that behavior by, you know, finding creative ways to, to create point solutions or, or things that matter uh, to those employees. And most recently bringing about a fertility um, opportunity, you know, for uh, folks in our in our workforce as the you know demographic of that workforce evolves, and uh, I think that's really important. And then we balance that on the other side. We have a wonderful foundation. Um, last year, you know, pouring about twenty million dollars into some partners and really looking for partners who specifically for us, since we're in dental insurance, um, we're focused on bringing access to oral health care to the communities we serve who may not have another channel to get there. Um, so it becomes, you know, some pretty simple, uh, simple focuses and then adding over the course of last year, things like teledentistry to make that access uh, even broader. But I'll pause there. And, you know, for us, that's, that's kind of a balanced picture of how we think about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back and talk a little bit more broadly about the the thoughts around health equity and more approach as opposed to specific tools and services um, because I think like when we start talking about the the questions that people have as benefits like where what can I provide to my employees and to their families that are going to be most useful to them. And I think as we step back and think about what is what are we putting together, how are we thinking about the whole person and the context in which, as you said, Julie, in which they live, learn, work, play, and pray? Um, and how much do we understand that? One, by asking the question. We, as, as an employer, we have people spend a significant part of our, their time with us and each day, but it's they live within a family, they live within a community. And how are we understanding for those folks who are living in a rural area, for those folks who are living in a city, one of the things that this pandemic has made very clear to us is that we are we were in people's homes and when people were working and that there are differences with our employees and their lived experiences, those who could work at home and those who could not stay at home and work in an environment? And how are we addressing those needs for them? And how do our benefits and the 
the totality of our benefits addressing that. What are we doing for their mental health? Um, and how are we normalizing people addressing mental health issues as part of our benefits and as part of our communication as companies? So I think that those that's to me like high on the priority list as we're thinking about what's going, what are going to be the we know that this is already predominant now, but as we're opening up and becoming coming more out, how are we helping people who've had a completely tran complete transformation of their lives, complete transformation of their families because of the pandemic and how that's impacted their mental and behavioral health and their lived environment? How are we preparing to support them as they return to the work to the workplace? Yeah, so I'm. I'm going to add a little bit to that from um, to me, it's like this thing about if you're, if you're having an aha moment that there is health inequity in America, that's unfortunate because the data has been pretty sound on this for a long period of time. And I think what's more important is, you know, what are we going to do about it? And for us, when we think about where we sit and the superpower we have as an insurance company, you got to recognize that, um, Part of it is we've got structural problems in the actual regulatory infrastructure. And we've got, and I'll give you an example of that. So if you go into HIPAA, HIPAA will say you've got to design group benefits and have them designed in a way where it's equivalent for all similarly situated individuals. And then you'd say, well, similar to whom? And when you ask that question, what you realize is there's no similar to whom. Like we're all different and we all have different needs and we all need different things. And so when you start to get that, that level of understanding that this is a structural problem and we've got to redesign a bunch of the things that would benefit individuals by having it only similar to their needs and to what they want. And to do that, you'd have to build a personalized health benefit. And what that looks like for us is another example is, you know, using deductibles or coinsurance doesn't that doesn't help that that's a terrible design mechanism um, deductibles mix loss events together and become very unaffordable i mean the average deductible in a health benefit plan today for a medical benefit is almost three thousand dollars 60 percent of americans can't come up with five hundred dollars an unbudgeted five hundred dollars so how are they i mean if you offer that benefit plan you aren't offering health insurance to that individual it doesn't feel like they've got security and health insurance in their health benefit and they don't consume the things that we know, if you think about like there's a type two diabetic that is dealing with that reality and they have to make a decision about, do I buy my blood sugar medicines or do I buy groceries? And the reality is you'd have to change and subsidize that benefit differently for that individual than you do for somebody else. Um, and we do the opposite. We use these blunt tools, coinsurance and deductibles to actually put barriers in front of people who, and again, if you go read the social determinants of health, the, the biggest variable that drives the inequity is the social economic status. And, and if you don't change benefit design to actually recognize that, you're just putting people into the path of health inequity. And for us, that's just something where we're trying to teach employers, this group model of insurance has to change. And something Iver just said, I think is really important. The very nature that we tied health insurance in America to the employer because of the tax code and now we're facing this digital age where work is becoming this much more amorphous, undefined thing, um, means we need to really step back and restructure group medical benefits to recognize that transition. And we all did very well at getting into the pandemic and figuring out like how to work virtually and make things happen well. I think as we come out of the pandemic, we need to look at what we accomplished and say, well, we need to change things permanently that are more equitable for everybody. And redesigning health insurance benefits has got to be at the top of the list. So not a new topic per se, but definitely an escalated topic and, and appreciate those insights. And Sarah, I think that great insight, you know, from both what you're doing for your employees, but then also on the commercial side. And Tony, you kind of mentioned that as well. And so, if we really think about those plan design measures, though, what to be more health equitable, how should employers be thinking about that whole person care exactly? Any thoughts on that? 
Are there specific conditions we need to be focusing on to expand access to? I don't know. I feel like I was looking up because <laughs> she, she <laughs> me. But, um, you know, I would say, you know, um, I'm looking at her because I think she touched on something really important, which is a benefit conversation can't just be about the health benefit you're providing to your employees. It's really become this holistic picture of um, helping, you know, the, the workforce really understand um, all of the different pieces that, you know, we're thinking about in response to them. And I think, you know, something that that's really, um, I think helped bring this to the forefront is not only, you know, last year with the pandemic and, and really this kind of escalated and, and you know, elevated view of um, that disparity, but it also, I think it gave people time to really solidify what their expectations are. And I know we're going to talk about talent later, but, you know, we can't, um, we can't have this conversation without thinking about since those benefits holistically are tied you know, to the employer that you as an individual have the decision-making authority to work for or not, um, uh, we have to think about it really holistically and we have to think about it in terms of, you know, how do we provide for work-life balance? How do we really get to what, you know, Tony started to touch on, which is, I think all of us who've worked in healthcare for a really long time are, you know, on this search for really, you know, that individualized, very personalized relationship with wellness and with health. And how do we create and bring, you know, as an employer to the forefront, all of the different um, things that individuals could have access to? How do we create avenues to those? How do we create awareness around those? Just so individuals can kind of take that power, you know, in their hand and, and start to, you know, access those points. And then separate from that, how do we through, you know, as an employer for us, it's through our foundation, but it's also through our partnership with other, you know, large, small, mid-sized organizations that, you know, provide um, access to oral health in our case, but it's, you know, how do we um, pull some of the levers that we have to appreciate that some of the same needs our employees have are experienced in the community. And for some, they, they may not even have the access, they may not even have the awareness. And so how do we pull on some other lever, levers like campaigns and communication and awareness and, you know, really get to, I think what we all hope, which is a, a big focus on personalized health, preventative care to really, you know, support individuals in, a, in living healthy um, and avoiding acute care, you know, where, where possible. Yeah, Sarah, um, something that you said sort of like brought to mind, especially when we, when we start talking about personalized care, we have this opportunity to really think about the data that's in front of us and say, what is one, I, I'm, I'm a data geek. I can't, you know, I'm a researcher by training. So I think I go back to the data and I say, what's this, what's the story that the data is telling me what's the, what's the information that I'm getting from the data, how my employees are utilizing their benefits, why they are, and really the question of what, when they're not, why aren't they? To, back to Tony's point, it's like, if you have a copay that's so high, it, basically it means that they don't have any coverage because they're not able to do the copay. And then I always bring people back to that thing of also ask, like, like, numbers can only tell us so much, then we have to actually ask our employees and get some contextual understanding of why and how um, so that we can get, get a better clarity and a better personalization of the services and the benefits that we are providing and that we want to provide. And then when we talk about engagement, it's like, well, if we you know, we put together all of these benefits and it's like, now we why are our employees not engaging? Um, and I think there's part of that is information education, but also a shared contribution to what the benefits are and what, what they're built. And I think, and like you said, we're going to get to this later, the expectation of um, the future generation of employees and the employee, employees that are coming out of um having lived in a pandemic to understand like, what do I prioritize and what is really important to me? And 
like spending t- spending time and having a holistic lived experience is going to be so important. And how are we creating benefits that support that? Support them not just in their health and their wellness, but in their financial well-being and their abilities to support and care for family members in the ways that they feel is most important. Um, how, how are we thinking about that as we make these adjustments to benefits so that it, they can be more equitable? And um, we also recognize that people have di- different lived experiences. Some people are caring for three generations and you know, have three generations in a home versus, you know, versus people like me who it's us and a couple of young adults. And how does that change the needs for their benefits and how are we personalizing their benefits to address those issues? I want to amplify, if I may, um, you know, you touched on something that I think is so critical. You know, we, we do, we have a lot of access to data, especially as an employer, but it's those conversations. It's doing focus groups. It's doing round tables. It's having those communication channels open that has given us probably the greatest insight. And just one quick example of that last year in the pandemic, we had really focused our foundation to be partnered with you know, folks in the community to deliver oral health care to folk, people who don't have access to that. And what we found kind of past March, past April and going into May was that they were having to shift their focus toward food insecurity and away a little bit from oral health. And that's the community really saying, this is what we need. And so we found ourselves as a foundation really supporting that food insecurity um, and felt, you know, of course, if, if that's what the community needs, then, you know, that's where we want our employees engaged and we really want to rally around that as an organization and deliver that. But, you know, a great example of those insights when you have those communication channels open, you can more quickly see, hear, and feel what the need is and then mobilize to respond to that. And it, it goes the same with just talking to employees and, and really understanding what they, what they want, what they need, um, and how we we can make that happen. And that ability to pivot where the needs are um, and being good corporate citizens and being good community corporate citizens and engaged in the community so that you're not, you're hearing what's happening and you're able to be able to respond in that way because employees live in a community and they want to see their community, they want to be engaged with their community and being in our homes, we really began to understand the people who are around us and how that matters. And I don't, and I, I know that we're going to talk about this. I, we're, that's not going, we're not going to go back to that isolation because we've been in isolation and our, our appreciation and need for community and serving our communities is going to continue. Yeah. One thing I just want to highlight that the discussion is talking about is this ability to be adaptive to the realities of today. And tomorrow's realities look different than today's. And if you think about one of the challenge in, especially employer-sponsored healthcare, there's this phrase I use all the time. It says, disease doesn't recognize the tax year, right? Or health burden doesn't recognize the tax year either. And the fact that we haven't built an adaptive chassis that can respond real time to what consumers need is a real problem that does drive this health inequity. A clear example was the pandemic. Think about it, the pandemic is happening. Congress takes action in the CARES Act and the Families First Act to say, look, coverage has to change. You must cover diagnostic testing of COVID. You must cover any treatments of COVID. Think about that's not adaptive. We don't, Congress, using Congress as the adaptive mechanism is a problem. Like we should be, we should be designing in our own communities, like how that would look different. And what Bind did, what was so interesting to us when that passed is you know, all of our plan sponsors came and said, hey, are you guys good? And we're like, look, we define coverage as conditions and conditions have care journeys that are gonna bounce all over time. And if you think about COVID, which is an infectious disease, how would you actuarially wanna cover infectious disease from a risk management standpoint. Well, how you'd want to cover infectious diseases, test early and often, arrest the, arrest the spread of that infectious disease as fast as possible, because actuarially you'll prevent more disease from happening and you'll actually save 
the pooled resources for other conditions that are going to arise. So for us, we didn't have to change anything in our plan design. All of that was zero dollar in our plan designs already. And to me, it was just the shining light of we need a much more adaptive chassis at the benefit design level that recognizes care journeys begin and end in time that doesn't follow the tax concepts and the group concepts of annual coverage. And until we start breaking that down, you're not going to have that transformative change in terms of how we want to let people have access. And that's the other thing that people don't realize is <clears throat> all of us as employers right now on this panel, we are building budgets that pre-fund the liability of health benefits in the future. And what we want to do is have those dollars in the hands of consumers building and designing what they need they're going to be much better at figuring out what they need and what works for them than somebody sitting far afield from them and not in their present reality. And the more we can make that, like I said, more of an adaptive like structure, the better the benefits going to be for that individual. So Tony, do you think that we should be subsidizing strategies to kind of actively address some of the known health inequities or are you saying something different? No, we absolutely. So that's to me, the, the one reason why we decided to do an insurance company again is the insurance company has a couple of superpowers that aren't being utilized in the way they should in this country. So the first is this idea of personalized subsidy. Um, there's, there's a way for you to think about like all of the conditions that will face an individual put in their, their socioeconomic reality, how much they make, where do they live? Um, and recognize that the market itself then, I mean, let's be honest, inner city care delivery is some of the most expensive care delivery in our country. And then when you put a deductible or co-insurance plan to somebody, they, they go and utilize the most expensive part. And it's not, no, it's no fault of their own that that reality exists. And so what you'd have to do is in a benefit plan, you'd have to change through subsidy the prices they would pay because it's just, it's inequitable and you'd have to have to go do that. And as you build this personalized subsidy structure, you can build and then map it to this idea of giving the consumer the needs that they define that they want as an ability to buy coverage, gives you this personalized coverage model that then activates the personalized experience version, which is what Sarah was talking about. I think one of the things that's so interesting is if you followed the venture capital community for the last decade, We've had an all-time high of investment in digital health um, ideas and concepts. It's all over the map. And what's so interesting is employers right now are still doing this version of, I'm going to pick a point solution and I'm going to just bank that point solution. And to me, it's like, no, what you should say is I'm going to change the way we offer coverage for type 2 diabetes. And then if you want to use Omada or if you want to use Livongo or if you want to use some other, you know, L2, you know, Verda, whoever it is that best fits you, well, you as a consumer about how to manage your diabetes, you should use that. And we should build subsidy to all of those players. And what you want is you want those innovations playing out against each other over time so that we're constantly improving care delivery tied to these ideas of improving conditions for consumers faster and better. And so to me, subsidy is absolutely one of the most important superpowers to getting health equity happening. It's, it's fascinating to me just, just listening because, you know, as, as you are as well, you know, we're, we're a very long tenured organization. So it's really, you know, fascinating for us is kind of the bringing together of as we're addressing the needs of a, you know, boomer population that works for us. And we're addressing the need of, you know, the 20 year old who, you know, buys subscriptions to everything and has, you know, I mean, my own daughter is like, you know, what is this deductible thing, you know? Um, <laughs> I think there is some opportunity for us to innovate and remember that we still have, you know, the, the very well-trained, you know, kind of the insurance plan guides your care and that's how, you know, where, where you learn where your access points are. Um, and so this, uh, you know, I, I agree with, you know, let's, let's get innovative and creative about, you know, designing the solution. And at the same time, remember that we have these varied generations working, you know, where 
we want to bring that um, education. Uh, we want to meet their needs too, and um, and it's going to evolve. And it is it is really exciting to imagine. And you know, I have three adult children, and so you know, one of my data points is just watching them interact with and you know behave with uh, these constructs that you know are very clear to me, obviously, at my age and in the business that I'm in. <laughs> I think we're, I think we're very accustomed to providing A and B. Here's A, here's B, take A or B, and then go forth. And, and we have generations who are very in the workforce who are very comfortable with A and B and saying, yes, I will take A or B and move on. And they don't think about it. And we have a new generation who has, um, uh, dismantled, deconstructed, they've deconstructed how they watch television and their choices of how they pay for the, um, their viewer, their viewer options. Um, and they, they want to deconstruct every aspect of like, I want A and C, not A and B. And I choose D and F for this part. And I think our ability to, um, understand where people's needs are and being able to meet those needs is going to be really important. Um, there's also a level of education that we that is needed for people to understand what it means for health and how to what it, the value of preventive health when you're young and you're healthy, you don't think about prevention, but we're, we're doing more and we sort of went to this area of wellness, where people said, well, for the people who have the time and the opportunity to do wellness, everyone's lived experience doesn't allow them to be able to do that in the same way the pandemic that some people could stay home and some people had to go to work. There was significant inequity there. And when we think about what are, what are the needs in, for each individual, how do we help to design that in a way that meets those needs that people can afford um, and that provide the coverage that will allow them to live their healthiest life and have the best outcomes for their lived experience and for what they and what they want their lived experience to be. Well, I think we're really kind of touching on that health literacy piece and and really what is it that should be the responsibility of the employer for health equity? I mean, just really kind of stepping back and thinking about that. Um, what, what responsibility should the employer have for health equity? The majority of people in this country do not, um, are not, when you ask them if they are health literate, if they have more than basic health literacy, the majority of this country does not. Um, and part of that has to do with understanding what health is and understanding their condition. It also has to understand, it has to do with understanding their health benefits and what services and um, what services they're receiving. And that is a challenge. And it is, it's not just the employer, not just the payer, but it's all of our responsibility to work on and do the, the job of educating people about health, about what it means to be healthy and helping them to define what that means for them and how they can possibly achieve it. Because if we don't do that, they're not gonna be able to communicate back to us, like this is what I need um, in order for me to be my healthiest self, in order for my family to be its healthiest self. If their expectations for um, their health outcomes are lower because they don't understand with where they should be. Um, or they have a different expectation than what is what is possible. And that's where we have inequities. If, if I expect to get poor service when I go to a health system because structural racism has defined that that's my lived experience and I don't understand to ask for more, then I will ask for less. And our job as in, is to say, this is what this is this is the opportunity and what do you want that lived experience to be? And how can we help design something? that will support that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we bear um, an incredible you know, responsibility. The organization I worked for before coming to Delta Dental, Nant Health was in the business of really um, screening for and, and you know, getting to personalized cancer care. And some of the data that we knew was that you know, an individual diagnosed with 
probably one of the scariest things you can be, you know, diagnosed with is, uh, you know, about over 65% of those individuals are going to seek that care in a, you know, small hospital in, you know, rural America, and thus be almost immediately removed from some of the clinical trials that might be available, removed from some of the university, you know, medical centers that might have, you know, some experience. And, you know, what was fascinating about that um, as an employer where we had a large, you know, a virtual workforce as well was, you know, we, we needed to, you know, find some solutions internally first to kind of experiment with, you know, how do you create this awareness and these avenues and how do you, you know, get clinical trials tied to the need of that individual patient wherever they may be. And then we played that out obviously as an organization. And what we realized was, I think to, you know, Tony's point earlier, we had to meet with regulators. We had to meet with some of the big medical insurers. We had to meet with providers. And we found ourselves really trying to pull that thread through the entire healthcare continuum, kind of following the journey of any potential patient. And so I think, you know, with that as a backdrop and as an experience for an innovative kind of startup organization, you know, as an employer, we have um, a responsibility both to through insights and through that dialogue again, you know, experience what our employees are experiencing wherever they may live. I mean, Delta Dental, we have offices. A lot of people um, have stopped coming to those offices during the pandemic. And I think um, I ever said it earlier, I don't know that we're going to return to this, you know, everybody commute in and commute out. So they're going to work and live in these communities where they seek care. I think it's important for us to understand what their journeys might be like we have this data, we know what percentage of our population has diabetes and, you know, is required to take medication. We don't know it at the individual name basis, but we can look at that data across communities. We can look at it across geographies and we can certainly look to, you know, advance our networks, build awareness, partner better and create some of those avenues to um, connect those dots or pull that thread for folks and, um, and make sure that at least we're you know, talking about um, maybe as simple as just an openness to continue the dialogue with our workforce about their own needs and the needs of the communities they live in and how we can, you know, do do better work to evolve with solutions. So I, I agree. I think we play because insurance is tied to who your employer with is and because individuals you know, sometimes don't, but, you know, we view ourselves as talent and, you know, we're, we're in, uh, we're looking for all kinds of talent all the time. I think um, we, uh, we do have a responsibility to um, talk about it, to drive change um, and to bring our insights to the forefront in some of what Tony talked about and, you know, in the ultimate quest to, to really um, make healthcare better. Yeah, we, I think there's really, we think about it in three ways real specifically about this health literacy problem. The first is we all got to simplify, like we got to simplify. And this industry is the king or queen, whatever, of th three letter acronyms, TPA, ACO, like just keep going, right? It, and, and, we, it, and it was so sad is we create entire conferences that perpetuate do you know value-based care do you know like and what it really means and we create all this like techno technocracy around like this is the way to speak health care it's just like we got we owe it to ourselves to simplify and and we got to get away from it and, and and get away from this badge of honor we created some some new thing and let's give it a three-letter acronym so that's first thing and then i think once you after you simplify you need to demystify it so the other thing that I think is so scary is we use fear and hope in this industry to market to consumers. Fear that you're gonna end up in a surprise medical bill situation or you better to have coverage or you know all this stuff. And then we sell them hope, which is, oh, don't worry that you know the benevolence of your employer is gonna give you a benefit or the you know, not-for-profit you know, health system is gonna take care of you. And we just gotta start saying like, guys, like we as a society own our own health. We got to demystify this. Like it's someone else's responsibility or it's some third party's responsible for it. It's like, no, we own it. 
we own it as a community, we own it as an individual, we own it for our families, right? And 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 then talk about like what does that mean? And and to be honest, like I mean, one of the things that's been so interesting about um, a, a personal journey of ours recently is we had one of our kids come out and, as trans, and so our entire family had to embrace what did it mean to be trans and. We, and it, it was this whole thing about, yeah, we're gonna be on this journey with you, Billy. Tell us what it is. Tell us how we can be part of it. How can we be supportive? What are the things we need to learn? Um, and, and then you end up in a place that's like, this is just life and it's not scary. And it's just part of the way we're gonna be as humans. And so we need that, we owe that to the entire health community to de demystify the way we approach this fear and hope reality of healthcare. And then the last thing that I think about is you got to make it contextualized. And the, and the amazing thing about if you look at any other consumer good and, and how you relate to it today, like pick anything, pick food, pick transportation, pick you know, social interaction. It's all contextualized to you. When's the last time you saw a contextualized benefit in healthcare? that they knew who you were, what you're doing. In fact, what you're really doing most of the time is filling out more paper on a clipboard that goes into some repository that isn't actually being connected to other data so that you can actually have a contextualized experience. You know, I think one of the things like, I, I was at Google now, like there's a reason it was so crazy. You're like, why can't I Google healthcare the way I can Google everything else in life? Well, the problem is we've set up an industry that has built walled gardens of data that say you can't get inside of here and use it to the benefit of consumers. Now we have legislation that's come out in the last you know, five, seven years that's going to start unlocking that reality. And it's the race now to simplify, demystify and contextualize to get people to say, look, this is just life and we can, we can come alongside of you when you're in your challenge. And if we can design that kind of experience, this whole thing about this term patient kind of goes away. Remember, patient is a term that was invented by the medical industrial complex to tell you how you should behave inside your own health state. And I can tell you, and I learned this from my mom, God bless her. Like she would walk into the physician's office with the Merck manual and her anatomy thing, and she would not take no for an answer. And she would drive to what she knew, what she felt to be true to her and for her kids. No college degree, wasn't fearful of someone in a white coat, and was just like, you don't call me a patient. I'm a human in front of you and I need your help. And we need to have that spirit. I am so glad to hear and it's amazing to hear your mom's story. I had a mom who was um, very much passionate and growing up in Mississippi, we have to recognize that all of these things that are built in these industrial complexes are built on um, institutional and structural racism. And like, there are people who, when they, black and brown people who, when they walk into that door, there is a barrier there and there are biases there that they encounter. And um, it is in order to address it, in order to uproot it, we have to acknowledge it. And we have to acknowledge that when we think about what are we building for our for for our employees, like what, what are the benefits that we're creating and how are we creating benefits that empower our employees to overcome and address some of those issues? How are we helping our employees navigate the healthcare system from a place of empowerment that your mom can, that your mom walked in? How are we, as, as we would say, putting our hand on a hand on their back to support them in doing that work by the tools that we give them and the resources that we give them and the ways that we educate them on how they should be treated and how they should expect to be treated and how do we back them up as part of that process as that payer um, who's 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 paying that who's part of paying that bill. So I think I think we have to acknowledge that because if we don't, we are leaving out a huge portion of our workforce and expecting them to fend for themselves in a system that was not designed for them and was designed actually um, against them and designed to keep them from achieving their most health and recognizing. And when we talk about rural areas, Sarah, you know, pointing out when you, when you are in a rural area and we, you know, and there are people who live in areas that 
are not, don't have multiple um, academic medical centers around them and aren't, have no knowledge or appreciation or understanding of those. And how do we, with our resources, bring that to their door? Te you know, technically, how do we bring that to their door to make sure that they're getting access to the best thing? Because sometimes they don't even know what they're not at, what to ask for and what they should ask for. How are we helping them to navigate a system that either was so far away from them that they couldn't reach it and didn't know anything about it, or that was designed and built for them to not actually utilize in the most effective way in the first place. Um, and so when we talk about addressing equi inequities and addressing health inequity and closing those gaps, those that ability to help people navigate these systems and get what they need out of the system is very important. My research focused from the beginning on how do I help people navigate the healthcare system to get what they needed out of their experience with the healthcare system. I started with how can we change the provider and how can we change the system? And I, I was like, eh, I'm a physician and I can say this. I, I don't know how much you're gonna change us, but I know that if the person who's in front of me and who's in front of that provider has a different expectation, the provider is going to respond and the system is going to respond differently. I, I love that because um, having been on the provider side for a long time, working in a large healthcare system, you know, really focused on uh, the disenfranchised and poor as a not-for-profit, um, you know, kind of learning there and then bringing that here to Delta Dental about three and a half years ago. One of the first things we did was just educate the workforce about what they had available to them and give them that lexicon or that language and, um, you know, bringing one of my learnings having had a military father who was of course, you know, nothing but compliant when his doctor told him, you know, what was, is, you know, this, this real shift in mindset, you know, call it, you know, you want to be, you know, you want to bring a patient advocate with you, or you want to have this consumer mindset, you need to participate. And I mean, it's your health. Um, and really bringing some of that education and that awareness, you know, just as a baseline for, for the employees here, you know, who 62 year old company, a lot of long tenured folks, and how do you kind of bring them along in really appreciating the, the mobility and the, the access we're trying to create with what we've designed and then seek their input on, okay, what are we not thinking about? <laughs> because we probably <laughs> haven't touched these in many, many, many years. And, um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's such a long journey, right? But I came to the payer side, you know, both um, on the medical side, now on the, the dental side for, for a reason. And that is if an individual doesn't know how to access the healthcare system and that a primary care physician will cost less than the ER or, you know, a, a nurse practitioner, you know, will, will cost even less than that. Then unfortunately the healthcare costs we're all bearing is that that, cold is walking into the ER because the, you know, the mother with a baby with an ear infection doesn't know where else to go either because, you know, she's uninsured or because um, she hasn't interacted, you know, with the system. So the, you know, the question is, you know, and kind of back to what Tony was talking about, you know, how do we accelerate bringing about that level of access that almost educates um, our communities how to access this very complicated um, healthcare continuum, right? You have hospitals, you have offices, now we have clinics, all guided by what consumers want, right? I don't want to walk into a hospital if I'm having a baby. I want to walk into a baby wellness center where, you know, I'm going to be cared for a little bit differently. And that brought about really great changes. And now those changes, we have to accelerate that consumer mindset, which is kind of new, I mean, it, it's, it's not that old, right? And, and really, I think, look to um, some of the, and, and I love the generations that we raised, you know, kind of coming in and, and having all these different expectations that, um, that are great because they, I think, you know, through their wants, needs, desires, how they interact with everything else they buy, they have that consumer mindset and will bring that with them to help us accelerate some of these changes. But it really, I do think it just starts with awareness and education and, and helping people gain that language or that confidence. I'm inspired that you had, um, you know, parents who, you know, were, were very engaged. I had a parent who wasn't, I mean, he just did whatever the doctor told him he needed to do. 
and he suffered for that, which was unfortunate. So, you know, our, um, you know, I'll pull every lever as an employer and, you know, love conversations like this to just feel like there are a lot of us working, playing, Tony, innovating right in this space. And I think it's going to take some of us in the long tenured organizations with that infrastructure to partner with innovators and partner with communities to really bring about bigger change um, that will benefit uh, a community that we're not benefiting yet. Yeah. But I, I'd I like had to kind of acknowledge just real quick our, um, our Q&A. We, we've had kind of a <laughs> difficult question come through that I'm not sure if you all have an answer or not, but I uh, would like to acknowledge it. So it's, how can we alleviate disparities that exist between employers? So we've been talking about the disparities between our populations, but they give the example of a high wage industry company tech and have generous benefits and tools for recruiting, whereas the lower wage industries that will provide minimal benefits, shifting the cost to patients and their spend. Uh, I'd just like to get your thoughts and your insights around that um, from the audience. Is it a total reward strategy? I mean, what thoughts on that? Well, so the first thing you've got to do is you, so it, the person who wrote the question is astute. There is definitely disparity between employer level and, and um, so in bind, we have high tech companies that have done the benefit with us. And we have very low tech, you know, service oriented businesses. We have um, that do the business manufacturing um, where people are making, you know, 40 to you know, $50,000 a year is their income. Um, and one of the things that we, you, you have to do is, what you don't see behind that is what, what is the total cost of care in those situations. And sometimes the tech companies enjoy a very low per member per month total cost of care because they have a high affluent, you know, highly educated affluent workforce, which again, if you follow the ESTO principles, that's gonna drive lower healthcare costs. And actually there's more money that's being spent by some of these employers in these other service-based industries. And then what you really wanna do is tell people, there's a way for us to, to take advantage of the fact that it does cost so much. Um, and what we've done in Bind is, we actually teach people like the old algorithm that sets that budget, which is claims beget claims, can be changed. And one of the things that we, because claims are just derivatives of treatments used to solve conditions. And then if you actually look at a condition and say, well, I, wanna, I want these treatments to be subsidized and I want these treatments to be subsidized from these providers because they are the highest quality and the highest efficient providers and then drive price tags that say, this is where it gets consumed instead of all these other places. And we all know like price variation is wide in the US healthcare system. And it's embedded in that ugly algorithm of claims beget claims. And so what you do is you say, I'm going to take all those dollars we've been inefficiently spending, and a lot of it still sits in waste, and I'm going to drive a better health benefit where you're going to get the things you need across your conditions and in your care journeys, and it's going to become more affordable. In a buying plan, there's no deductibles and no coinsurance. The average out-of-pocket our members spend is $448 a year. The average in the U.S. out-of-pocket in a benefit plan is $1,000. What happens is, so we've made healthcare very affordable. Our, and if you know benefit richness, our plans are at 90% actuarial value. Like that's a platinum level benefit plan if you were to define it in the exchange. And we've been able to do, and by the way, we do that while saving employers anywhere between 10 and 25% of the dollars they've been spending. And so what, what starts to happen is you start to take advantage of the fact that these employers, especially the people in the service economy, manufacturing economy, have got a place where the socioeconomic status is actually driving health, high health care costs, which is eating up all of their ability to give them higher wages or better benefits besides health care. And if you can make the health care benefit better, then I can have that translated into wage. One of our, one of our um, customers is a school system. They save $500,000 on a hundred employee life you know, school system, they put half of that savings back into teacher salaries. That's how we change the way this works. And that's how we start to create it more equitable by realizing the wasteful US healthcare system is stealing income 
and health status from people in a way that's just not correct. And there's a way to take advantage of it and almost use it like jujitsu that says, okay, we actually have funded all of this money and now we're gonna release it in a much more efficient way. I, I'm gonna take a completely kind of different, you know, perspective um, because where I wanna start is, you know, fortunate or unfortunate, um, a talent attraction strategy rests on an organization's ability to offer um, a, a compelling, you know, engagement strategy, which includes benefits, wellness, you know, and, and all of these things. So, you know, when I think about that question, which um, is a great question and, and certainly um, something that um, I would hope we all aspire to, uh, to bring about, I would kind of come at it from the angle of um, one, you know, kind of back to individuals and communities not seeing, feeling, and knowing where some of the avenues are to healthcare. Well, let's apply that to employers. So if you think about some of these players and where they attract talent and, and you know, where, where, uh, where they play, I think um, we see, uh, you know, some large communities left out. And so, you know, manufacturing sites and whatever, uh, notwithstanding. But I think with the, with the pandemic, for example, and this move for more organizations to include their, you know, remote workers and kind of expand their hiring radius to now cover kind of anywhere <laughs> you have Wi-Fi, what I hope that brings about you know, back to the, the very first conversation we were having about understanding the needs of your employees. What I hope that brings about is employers actually filling their talent pipelines and having different, you know, and, and people in communities having different access points to um, find employers that um, start to meet their needs for, uh, for that benefit design. And maybe, you know, um, as that, you know, talent, playground, if you will, kind of expands and, you know, different employers who maybe traditionally couldn't hire from some of these rural communities, some of these inner city communities, some of these places where we just haven't recruited from, will also start to change some of the expectations of the workforce. But I, I do think it's noteworthy, you know, probably for the, the folks um, attending today that that will you know, that will fundamentally then change and have to guide different engagement strategies and different talent strategies, because the, the fact of the matter today is those of us really seeking to drive high engagement numbers and keep people really tied to a purpose and um, help people feel like, you know, we're meeting their needs um, rests on our ability to compete in that space. And so the bigger question then becomes, you know, What's the, you know, how do we break that, um, that competition so that, you know, folks like Ivor, folks like I, you know, can really attract <laughs> some great talent. Um, so maybe that's a bit provocative, but I think, you know, we can't, we can't have the one conversation without thinking about that engagement, that talent, and, you know, what we're all in pursuit of when we wear the other side of our hat. Yeah. And I, I, I'll just add really quickly, um, my my family was that family who had you know who had benefits that, but could never utilize those benefits because any copay or difference was out of the realm of possibility um, until we got coverage through the vet to my dad got coverage through the veterans administration and still had to pay there um, and I think what's really the ability for employers to think about not just the health benefits and like, how are we working with families to think about their financial wellness um, and their financial planning? And I'm not just talking about people who have a portfolio with stock that need to figure out how they manage their wealth. I'm talking about people who are thinking day to day, how am I paying my bills? How do I make a choice between paying my light bill and my gas bill or paying for my medication? And what are we doing when we're thinking about the benefits and our benefits package to helping them make decisions around their benefit choices in a way that financially thinks about the totality 
of what they live. For people who are living paycheck to paycheck, um, they're, 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 they're making choices every day, every month, every week. Um, and how are we helping them think through those choices by the services that we're providing them as part of their benefits as well, not just people who have a portfolio to manage. Oops, maybe just. Well, thank you. I mean, I, some great perspectives today. I mean, the one thing I think we can take away from this is that together, we definitely can create something better uh, for a future where health benefits work for everyone. We can make a profound and a lasting impact on millions. And so it's, it's in our hands and um, we will improve it and do better. And thank you for your time today. I'm gonna to turn this back over to health though at this point. And I think we have some yoga coming up. <laughs> thank you to Julie and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now please welcome yoga instructor, Emma Poole. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. So this is just going to be about 15 minutes of a simple yoga flow. It's meant to get your breath moving and a little bit of circulation in your body, since I know that so many of you have been sitting <laughs> for most of the afternoon. So please feel free to join me. You can grab a mat if you have one. And if you don't have a mat, just take a seat on the ground or even in your chair, you can do some of it or all of it. Um, it's really just meant to give you a little break in your day. In the next couple of moments, go ahead and let your hands just rest on your lap. And if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, I invite you to do so. As you sit up tall, relax your shoulders down and back and begin to tune in to the sound of your breath. Feeling the expanse of your inhale, the softening of your exhale. And just noticing this thing that your body does all day long with a little bit more awareness right now. Take a deeper breath in through your nose. Open your mouth, exhale. Again, breathing in. And release your breath. As you press into your seat, inhale and reach your arms up over your head. And as you exhale, pull a prayer into your heart. Just taking a moment to think about what you're feeling right now, whether you're at ease or maybe a little bit tired, just notice and feel a deep breath rise into your heart. And a slow exhale, pour down your legs. You can gently open your eyes as your hands return to your lap. Take a breath in here. Drop your right ear toward your right shoulder as you exhale. And just notice what's happening in the left side of your neck, if anything. Let your chin fall toward your chest. And then drop the left ear toward the left shoulder. Let the weight of your head create that natural stretch. Breathing in again. Exhale, chin to chest. Right ear to the right shoulder. Chin to chest. And left ear to the left shoulder. Pick your head back up. Go ahead and interlace your hands right in front of your heart. As you exhale, turn your palms inside out and stretch them up toward the ceiling. Let your shoulder blades drop down and back. Keep rooting into your seat and just start to push your hands a little bit higher. Maintaining your breath here and feeling a big opening through the sides of the waist. 
Inhale as you are. Exhale, send your arms over your head like you're pushing the air away and contract your belly. Taking that two more times, inhale to sit up. Exhale, push the arms away. Good, inhale, lifting up. And exhale, rounding your spine, contracting your belly. Inhale to sit back up and as you exhale, cactus your arms. So start to pull the elbows apart as if your shoulder blades are moving toward each other. Open your hands nice and wide and just allow the front of the body to expand. So often we're leaning forward, we're looking down, we're slouching. So take the next couple of breaths to just keep your heart really radiant. Yeah, one more inhale here. As you exhale, release your right hand out to the right, send your left arm up and start to side bend. And so you're pressing down into your opposite left hip as you begin to send that left arm just a little bit further over the body. Take one more big breath in. And then you'll sit up and find a twist to your right. Let your right fingertips come back behind you and wrap your left hand around the front of that right kneecap. Inhale to expand the body. And as you exhale, twist a little bit deeper. Come back to center, reach both of your arms up. Exhale, cactus your arms again. Breathing in. As you breathe out, lean to your left, start to send that right arm up and over the body. So creating a side bend on the opposite waist. We always wanna find a counter action. So if our arm is reaching forward, we wanna think of our hip and our seat pulling back. Take another breath in here. As you exhale, you'll sit up and find that twist to the left. So this time your left fingerprints are behind you and your right hand is around the kneecap. Breathing in, getting a little taller and breathing out, twisting a little deeper. Bring your torso back to center and we'll go ahead and shift onto our hands and our knees. So finding in all fours position, palms under the shoulders, knees under the hips. Right away, tuck your right toes under and extend your right leg on the mat back behind you. Have to move forward a little bit and just begin to shift front to back. So you're getting a stretch here in the ball of the foot and all along that calf muscle, the back of the knee, and the hamstring. Good, take one more round. As you exhale, look toward the back of your mat, start to kick your left shin a little bit further behind you. Place the inner blade of your right foot on the ground and send your right arm into the air. And this is what we call a modified side plank. And it's a really nice way to open up the side body, which actually helps to create increased circulation and blood flow especially if you've been pretty sedentary all day. Really reaching through that right fingerprint as you press actively through the right foot. Take a big breath in here. As you exhale, come back to your hands and your knees. Right away, tuck your toes under, sink your belly and open up your chest. As you exhale, push the tops of the feet into your mat, round your spine and bring your chin to your chest. Take that again, tuck your toes, sink your belly, opening your heart. Exhale, pointing your toes, pushing the ground away and rounding your spine. Coming back to a neutral spine, we'll switch sides. So take your left toes and start to extend the left toes on the mat front to back. Maintain awareness in your hands and that right leg and just notice the feedback that your body gives you here, that stretch up through the back of the left knee and hamstring. Taking one more little round. And then you'll start to come to stillness, looking toward the back of your mat, kick that right shin further behind you. You're gonna open up the left side of the body. So the left arm lifts up and it begins to reach over the ear as you press fully into your left foot. Use what is touching the ground here, the right hand, the right shin, the left foot, to create stability so that you can create more opening through the left side of the waist. One more big breath. 
and then gently return to your hands and your knees. This time you can tuck your toes under, walk your palms a couple inches forward. And as you exhale, lift your hips and slowly press back into down dog. Now, some of you might be a little bit tight. Feel free to keep your knees really bent and that's gonna allow you to lift and lengthen your spine. Push your fingerprints into the ground and just let your head drop and see if you can take a couple of slower, deeper breaths here. Inhaling and exhaling. Lift your chest, look to the top of your mat and begin to walk your feet all the way forward. When you get there, bend your knees quite a bit, catch a hold of your opposite elbows and start to sway side to side like you're in a little ragdoll position here. Do whatever feels good. There's really no wrong or right way to approach this. Just see if you can use the weight of your physical body to enable a little bit more release through your spine, your jaw, your eyes. Take a nice full breath in and then drop your hands, <sighs> exhale your air. And with soft knees, roll yourself up to stand. And let's roll those shoulder blades up. Exhale, circle them down. One more time, lifting them up, circling them down. As you inhale, reach your arms out and up over your head. And as you exhale, cactus those arms, bend your knees and just let the whole front body, the solar plexus, the chest, the lungs open up. On a breath out, you're slowly gonna hinge at your hips and release your hands to the ground. Step your left foot back into a lunge. Step your right foot back, finding your plank position. And as you exhale, you'll drop your knees, bring them about as wide as your mat and start to sit your tailbone tip back toward your heels, finding your child's pose. So this is a nice little resting pose here. You can let your whole body just soften, allowing your head to drop, breathing through the base of your hips and tailbone all the way up into the tips of your fingers. And this can be a really nice pose if you're feeling overwhelmed or kind of stressed out or anxious, just letting yourself drop toward the ground and feeling the solidity of the ground holding you up. Take a big breath in. And as you exhale, just walk your hands toward you, roll up to sit and swing your legs out from underneath you. And we'll end together, just taking a moment, let your legs stretch out long so you can open up uh, the underside of the body. And then eventually you'll bring the soles of the feet together with the knees bent like a little butterfly shape. Take your hands and wrap them around the fronts of the ankles. As you inhale, imagine that you're sitting up a little bit taller, arching your spine, pulling the shoulder blades down and back. And as you exhale, rounding your spine, hollowing out your belly. Do that again, inhale, sit up, but this time you'll stay upright, leading with your heart, just walk your hands further forward and see where your head naturally drops. If you need a little bit more flexibility in the legs, you can scooch the feet further forward. And I invite you to turn your palms face up and just let your head drop. Feel the weight of your brain falling into your skull. And see if you can expand and lengthen the breath here, right in between the shoulders, right at the back of the heart there. One more full breath in. As you exhale, gently bring yourself all the way back up to seated. You can cross your ankles. Keep one of your hands right on your lap, turning your palm face up and put your other hand on top of your heart. 
And just take a couple of breaths here. Feeling your heart beating under your palm. Knowing that at any point in your day when you need it, you can pause and choose to listen to the sound of your breath, to feel the sensation of your breath moving through you. To end practice this afternoon, we'll find a deep, slow breath in together. So take your time when you're ready. Inhale fully. And exhale it out. Have a beautiful rest of your day, everybody. Thank you so much. Namaste.